Welcome to Don't Ask That Question. I'm Kelly O'Mara. Ask yourself this. What if the government decided to invent a great lie to justify a disastrous war? What would happen to the people who know the truth? I'm going to talk with author of Extreme Prejudice, Susan Lindauer. She'll deliver an explosive, high-tension expose of the real facts surrounding the CIA's advanced warning of 9-11 and an insider's look at Iraqi pre-war intelligence. Susan was one of the very few U.S. assets covering Iraq before the war. She reveals the depths of deception by leaders in Washington and London to promote a successful image of their terrorism policy and the shockingly shocking brutality to suppress the truth of their failures from Americans and the world community. Former congressional staffer Susan Lindauer performed as a U.S. intelligence asset covering Libya and Iraq at the United Nations as a back channel on matters of anti-terrorism from 1993 to 2002. Most notoriously in the summer of 2001, her team <clears throat> warned about a major terrorist attack involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center. Lindauer also campaigned heavily against the war in Iraq and developed a comprehensive peace framework through her back channel in the run-up to the war. In this two-part series, she'll tell us the story of what happened when she tried to disclose the true facts of Iraqi pre-war intelligence and the 9-11 warning to Congress and the American people. She details the nightmare of her arrest on the Patriot Act and her imprisonment without a trial at the notorious Carswell prison inside a Texas military base. <clears throat> Welcome, Susan. You know, uh, your story shocked me um, when I became aware of it, when I was still a reporter. And, uh, you know, I've known you for, for years. Uh, frankly, I, I just couldn't believe what I was reading. So we'll get into our relationship as the story unfolds, as you tell this story. So first, I'd love you to take this first hour of this two-hour uh, series to discuss how you became involved as an asset beginning with who was responsible for bringing you in as an asset? Kelly O'Mara, <laughs> you occupy a special part of my heart and my story. Uh, I would like everyone to know that Kelly was the former chief of staff to Congressman Andrew Forbes. And she Michael. also, I'm sorry? His name is Michael Forbes. Michael Forbes, excuse me. That's okay. Congressman Forbes and Kelly was one of two witnesses who testified on my behalf in federal court and played a role in saving my life <laughs> when the government tried to exterminate me. I, my book is called Extreme Prejudice, and they really did do everything in their power to destroy me and have me locked away for up to 10 years without the right to a trial. And it was Kelly O'Mara's integrity that and her insistence on honor and truth in courtroom testimony that 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 helped stop that from happening. So Kelly and I uh, go way back. Uh, we belonged to a Kelly used to be a Washington insider, and she when she was a chief of staff for Congressman Michael Forbes, <laughs> uh, she uh, was part of a of a of a special group of. Uh, Senate, and it was mostly mostly a, a group of congressional staffers mm -hmm. that included a lot of Senate staffers as well. And we would meet once a week and she would meet with, I would go in with my defense intelligence handler, Paul Hoven. And at that point, it was a robust, vibrant, dynamic conversation. We had marvelous political debates on the issues. Mm -hmm. And Washington was a different place. Uh, I had been working as a uh, congressional staffer for a Democrat, uh, Ron Wyden, who is today is in the United States Senate from Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so I was on the Democrat side of the aisle at the time, even though I was a defense intelligence asset. And Kelly was on the Republican side, but always independent. And the dynamic of conversation and give and take and moving ideas. It was at Washington was a, a, a better place at that point. It, it was, was a, it really was fun. Yes. And we had 
good time. And yes. we had great, smart people who were uh, passionate, always passionate, God, always passionate about their, about their beliefs. Mm -hmm. But we were, we were trying to build a, a better America and we were having great uh, dynamic conversations. And uh, Kelly knew Paul Hoven. And I, Paul Hoven was my defense intelligence handler. Paul had a, his, a, a phenomenal history in his own right. He'd been part of the Pentagon underground that exposed the overbilling of the, in the defense, by defense contractors and like the, the, the $10,000 toilet seat. Mm -hmm. uh, remember all of those things? Paul Hoven. Was, wasn't that with Danny Sheehan? With Danny Sheehan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the two of them did it together, and they and and they were the Christic, the Christic uh, Foundation, wasn't that what it was called? The Christic Foundation, yeah, yes, Danny Sheehan, the Christic Foundation, Paul Hoven, and they were exposing the 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 fraudulent overcharging at the Pentagon uh, by the defense contractors, and they were being fed intelligence by Pentagon officials who were sick of being forced to buy military hardware that was not tested, that was being uh, pushed on the military that they did not want to buy. Mm -hmm. That was a big problem was that they, you know, they had money to spend and, and the Pentagon at that point was very fiscally conservative and wanted to take a more hard line of responsibility towards taxpayers. And so my defense intelligence handler, Paul Hoven and Danny Sheehan and the Christie Institute were all involved in that. Again, these were these were the, the Christic Institute was more of a a uh, little bit more liberal. It was it was you know it was this was a different Washington where mm -hmm. people worked together across party lines. Paul was as conservative as you could ever get. Yeah, you could not be more conservative than Paul Hoven. He was right. totally diehard, uh, diehard Republican. But he won. But the goal of better government and uh, and he did not want to undercut the soldiers. He was deeply loyal to soldiers, and he felt that the that they that they were getting uh, shafted by these defense purchases. So Paul Hoven and Kelly O'Mara and Susan Lindauer and a, a bunch of other chiefs of staff from the the Senate side mostly were, were we would meet at a Hunan restaurant on Capitol Hill. We'd all walk over there and it was just, it was, it was, it was, those were some of the best nights, yeah. you know. We, we just we talked really shop, had. we just talked shop, you know, and everybody had something interesting to say. And there were a lot of people from the Pentagon often came over, you know, that we knew and, uh, and, and it was, you know, it was pretty naive, I think, in, in many ways, because some of the stuff we talked about was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. anyway, but it was a time. You know, it was it was a good time. It was a really good time, and it was during those years that we all uh, we were all committed to. We love all of us loved our country. Yeah. We loved the United States. We may have had different different. We always had different ideas, and and we were. And it was a dynamic exchange. It was really cool. Yeah. But um, but we all passionately wanted to see America strong. And, and and powerful in the world and to be yeah. with leadership, you know, you know, the, the idea was that leadership choices transcend party. And yeah. you're and and I think maybe maybe you have a, a you want to say something about that because you No, no, I, 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 I agree with you. And I think that we we all sort of uh listen to each other, whether we agreed or not. It was, you know, it was an open conversation, always. Yeah, yeah. And really, really cool people. So it was during that period in the 90s that I began, that Paul Hoven had recruited me to, um, to contact both the Iraqis and the Libyans. We started off in Libya and I was the, I was the one engaging in direct communications with the ambassadors from Libya and Iraq and senior diplomats at those embassies. And we were, uh, our purpose was um, to f identify terror. I was an anti-war person. Right. And I was very strongly, I I've always been strongly anti-war. So I applied my anti-war philosophy to anti-violence against, you know, on both sides of the aisle. Mm 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, uh, and, and the Arabs were able to hear me because I was consistently opposed to violence. Mm-hmm. And so even if they were more militant, more, they were, they were more militant, they were more um, uh, cunning, I would say, too. The, the Arabs will, will they're, they're, they're canny politicians and they're foxy. Gaddafi was not, was a genius. He was not crazy. But when I first started out, everyone was like, oh, he's this crazy man. No, <laughs> he smoked a lot of hashish. <laughs> okay. Smoked a lot of hashish, but he was not crazy. Um, he was, he was a cunning, very cunning man mm-hmm. and very passionate and committed. He was a so deep socialist, almost communist. Um, mm-hmm. He really wanted all of, you know, Libya was run by 2000 families and they all got to, they would all meet together. Gaddafi would call a meeting of the families. They'd all come together at an assembly and then they would just, they, they, they smoke hashish. <laughs> they would, and they would, and they would work out the deals of how their families would interact with each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they were Bedouin, they were Bedouin tribes, and he made sure that all of the families received uh, bounties from o- Libya's oil wealth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that can be good and that can be bad. Uh, a Yemeni, t- to be fair, a Yemeni uh, ambassador to the United Nations once told me that he went to, he was visiting Libya and he went to a hotel and he went into, the, he was looking for, for, for a waiter and he couldn't find a waiter, so he wandered back into the kitchen and he saw a burner, like a gas burner stove and the the gas was turned on high. And he looked around the kitchen, he said, there's nobody here. What, why, why do they have this gas stove on when nobody's here? And so he turned it off and the man, somebody came running in and said, what have you done? What have you, this is a true story. What have you done? And he said, well, well, you had the gas stove on. Why do you do that? said. Because there are no matches. All the matches are requisitioned and allocated. And we don't have enough matches to light the stove every day. Oh. Okay. We don't have the matches. How am I going to light the stove again, you dummy? You dumb foreigner coming into my country. Damn you, damn you. And that was the story of Gaddafi as well. That he, because he was, a, he was a socialist slash communist. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, the any time you have that kind of heavy government influence and controls over people's lives, it always gets messed up. Mm-hmm. Even if you're in a s- simple country, it still gets messed up. Sure. They have matches. And the other thing that Gaddafi did, which is also true, uh, from the Yemeni ambassador who stayed at the hotel, when Gaddafi wanted to make sure that all the Bedouin families would have housing throughout Libya, he invited, while he was building the houses, he invited the Bedouin families to come into Tripoli and Sirta, and they were invited to stay at these hotels. And so they arrived with their sheep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They arrived with their sheep and their goats, mm-hmm. and they all lived in the hotels. Wonderful. And the goats and the sheep destroyed the hotels because they were inside the rooms with these people. They're like, we're not going to leave our sheep behind. If we have to come to this damn city, we're bringing our goats with us. Mm-hmm. And they did. And they destroyed the hotels. So they had Gaddafi built these magnificent hotels. And then the, the sheep, I'm not even making, this is not a racist comment. This is a factual story. Um, the, um, they, they were destroyed by the, by the, the by the, by the, by the, and the, and the, and the Bedouin were very unhappy. They wanted to go back to the land. So right. Gaddafi built them houses and sent them back out of the city. Wow. But, um, but, you know, so, so, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, glorifying Gaddafi to the extreme that a lot of people do. Gaddafi mm-hmm. had a lot of good things. Uh, he had a $500, um, let's see, if I, I think it was, I think there was a marriage bonus of $5,000 when you, in, in their dinar, 5,000 dinar, when a man got married to his wife. And he, they had free healthcare and free education, and um, and they had free. They had everybody was guaranteed a house. But as I just told you, there were there were problems as this as as this growing pains. They did they didn't have enough matches to light the stoves. 
Mm -hmm. um, but also we had the problem now we now now getting to more serious things we were uh my first issue was libya and the lockerbie case i am the one who negotiated the handover of the two libyans for the lockerbie trial i also ran an operation um a very successful operation compelling Gaddafi to get the terrorists out of libya and and to move them from that he was giving them sanctuary that's absolutely true and he was he was taking every baking everybody in and we had to get him to get rid of them and that involved president hosni mubarak and president hosni mubarak at the time was deeply fright um, threatened by real terrorists not like fbi created terrorists but real people who were you know, Islamic jihadists who wanted to overthrow any secular government. So mm -hmm. we united, so Gaddafi and Mubarak were, became united together mm -hmm. on this basis that they both shared a mutual enemy. And Gaddafi needed a way out of, of his isolation. So he turned to Egypt uh, and, and put, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars building hotels in Egypt, taking Libya's oil money and showering Egypt with investment dollars that they used very successfully to so build. Let me interrupt you. Let me let me interrupt you there. OK, so so <clears throat> we, we were told one thing, right? But we later find out or you say uh, in your deposition that it was others who actually are responsible for the downing of Lockerbie. Yes. Or Pan Am 103. Yes. So explain that. Well, there is, and there's a question of sanctions. Libya definitely gave sanctuary to the men who did Lockerbie. Who were they? Uh, that was Abu Nidal and his associates. Abu Nidal freely declared that he had done Lockerbie, that he was and the mastermind. He Nadal freely declared that he had done Lockerbie and that he had, um, uh, that the, the two Libyans, FEMA and McGrathy had nothing to do with it at all. And I believe that's true. However, the sanctions that were in place were, uh, were imposed on Libya for several reasons. One, because they did give sanctuary to terrorists and because they did hide the conceal and protect the real men who did Lockerbie. And at that point, that was Abu Nidal who was living in Libya. So in a, in a perverse sort of way, this was the game that where you get into the Gaddafi's cunning mind. Um, as far as he was concerned, he's like, I, we didn't do Lockerbie. We didn't do Pan Am 103. Oh, no, 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 no. We didn't do that. And he's right. But he did give sanctuary and financing. And shelter. Them. Right. You, we just named the wrong person. And, right. and so, you know, we played this game of, of me saying to Gaddafi, I know who did it. And you know who did it. And you know you're giving, you know that Abu Nidal is in, Tripoli at this very moment. And if he's not in Tripoli, he's going down the coast to his beach house, <laughs> you know, and he's, and he's out on the water and, and he's, you, you, you've given this man freedom in your country. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, you know, we, but we had to play this game of, you know, Chuck Schumer insisting that it was McGrahi and FEMA and Gaddafi saying, but you have the wrong man. And I said, but we know who you are. We know who these people are. Mm. And so how did this affect your case? Well, I, I was involved in, a, in several parts of this. Like I said, my first operation was to get the terrorists out of Libya. And we did that with Mubarak. Mm. Mubarak was key. And mm. Kadab, that changed the whole dynamic of okay. Libya help us providing major valuable financial assistance for economic development projects in Egypt. Okay. Which raising, now, now realize ter extreme terrorism derives from extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. So they raise the standard of living. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. so that these people would have more jobs, more income, and therefore the lure of the mosques would Mm -hmm. not be so fierce. Mm -hmm. And Gaddafi actually helped tamp down the radical Islamic agenda Mm -hmm. in Egypt for a lot of years. It was very valuable. And at the same time, we were involved in operations to get the terrorists to get Mubarak then used his pressure and said, look, I am your brother. We are brothers. Mm -hmm. You have terrorists in your country who want to kill me. Mm -hmm. We must get these people out of your country. And so what would happen is Libya would kick, you know, we would pressure Libya Mm -hmm. and Libya would kick, they, and they were terrorists. They really were. And they were, they were the real thing. And they would be forced out of Libya. And as they were leaving Libya, something would happen to them. Maybe they'd be on a bus and the bus would just, you know, there'd be an accident mm-hmm. or they'd get shot or something would happen and they would die. Everybody would die. And so the terrorists were being eliminated as they were leaving the country. And that's pretty much how we were doing it. Okay. Um, and, and so it was, it was a, it was a, they were being killed off as they left the country. But Abu Nidal was too powerful, too big of a name. So when he actually made it out of Libya, he got into Egypt. Uh, at that point, I was blamed by Abu Nidal for getting him kicked out of Libya. And Abu Nidal put a contract out on me to have me killed. <laughs> Ab- Abu-, Abu Nidal put a contract out on my life. And I had Paul Hoven, our friend Paul Hoven, was coming, would come, and they they and Abu Nidal and um Monser. Monster al Qasar did it together. Monster al Qasar uh, put a contract out on my life through one of the Colombian drug cartels because mm-hmm. the hair, the, it's very important to understand, I'm sure you, you're a very smart audience. The terrorism and terrorism financing is through the opium trade and Afghanistan, the Taliban, the uh, Iran. All of it is the hev- heavily connected, and that is connected into the Colombian drug cartels. So the raw poppies and the uh, the Colombian drug cartels, and so they fused together. Albu Nidal, Monsar Alcazar put a contract out on me through the Colombian drug cartels. Paul Hoven and the defense and the Department of uh, Drug Enforcement Agency stopped it, and. Abu Nidal ends up in Baghdad. This would become very important to my future in the next show. Uh, or maybe I should just tell you uh, now so that we can finish this, this thread. Sure. When I, when I uh, was building my, when I had moved on to Iraq and added Iraq to my portfolio uh, with Libya, Libya was my first country. When I added Iraq, Abu Nidal was moved into Lib- into Iraq, and it was my uh, deep. Um, he was a high level mukhabarat. He was a spy. He was somebody that I recruited to be a spy for the United States. And at this time, George Tenet said that he could count on one hand the number of spies inside Iraq, because as soon as Saddam Hussein found them, he would kill them off. Mm-hmm. He would, he'd tor- they'd be tortured, brutalized, mm-hmm. sodomized, and, and killed very slowly. You know, they, they'd cut their fingers off one by one, then they'd kill them. You'd wish you were dead long before it would ever happen. And he, so this, this was a very big deal that I was able to get this guy. And it was my guy who got Abu Nidal because mm-hmm. I requested that he get him because of Lockerbie. Mm-hmm. So... Um, but that is, that goes to when I paid this man, this Iraqi diplomat, $2,000, that is where I get into trouble with the feds and the money that, that, uh, that I was, I was accused of receiving was actually not for me at all. It was for him and his life. He was that my, my Iraqi agent was it was it was inside Baghdad former diplomat I met him in New York he had tried to defect to the United States through me mm-hmm. and I had messed it up 
Paul, it was one time that Paul Hoven just ripped me to shreds, dragged me over the coals. I got beat up for months over this. They're like, Susie, when somebody tries to, when an Iraqi or a Libyan ever tries to defect to you, you just take them. You don't tell them. I, I said, no, he shouldn't defect. He should go back to Iraq and spy for us. Because I was like, I, don't need, I already know what you got. I need you in there so you can help us. And then you can be a source of intelligence on terrorism mm -hmm. because you're high level Mokhabar, he's high level Mokhabarat, which was Saddam's uh, domestic security service. So I was like, I don't need you in, I don't need you to live in Virginia. I mm -hmm. need you in Baghdad. And then you can help me in Baghdad. He mm -hmm. was married, he was, he was married to um, the daughter of an Iraqi general. And um, he was close friends, personal friends with Qusay Hussein, who was the son of Saddam Hussein. So what you find is this circle of people that we're dealing with in these relationships is very small. It's a very small, in, in Iraq and in Libya, it's a very small group of people who run everything. And he was part of that, you know, he, had, he had penetrated that internal upper Iraqi strata and i did not need him to come to virginia right it'd be useless to me in virginia mm -hmm. but they were like really mad at me. they got really mad at me that, now that would be I, paul hoven and dr fuse well paul hoven and dr fuse but also you know the defense intelligence agency was like what the hell are you thinking and i'm like no i'm thinking smart so okay so <laughs> yeah. CIA. he was the one who got he was the one my guy was the one at my request got Abu Nidal in exchange for the $2,000. So I paid him $2,000 and I did not receive that money. Mm -hmm. See, this is where we have this, this, um, this, this fight with the CIA. Well, we'll, we'll come to that in the second show uh, as to how that comes about. But for those people who are like looking at my bio and saying, but didn't you do that? Didn't you take, didn't you, know, you're accused of, of taking, sorry, taking money from the Iraqis. Did you do that? Yes or no? My answer is no, I did not. What I did was I received money for him and mm -hmm. I set up a double agent in, well, inside well, Iraq. Let me interrupt you here. Let me interrupt you here, okay? Who else in DIA did you work with directly? Uh, with I, my other contact was uh, with uh, Richard Fuse, who was CIA. So I had Paul Hoven, who was interacting with on my behalf with the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh -huh. and then I had Richard Fuse, CIA, CIA. And, and I you never talked to anybody else in any of those agencies. You always spoke with those two people. Well, I had a, um, I, I, I did have. As years go by, I did have conversations with other people um, and they would come see, seek me out when they needed me. When somebody needs to get intelligence and there, there are ways that they let you know that they are spooks and that they, you know, they, they like one day somebody came to me and uh, on Libya when we were doing the Lockerbie negotiations. And I was uh, at that point, the, the press secretary and speechwriter for United States Senator Carol Mosley Braun. And literally, I, I walked out of the Senate Hart, the, the Hart office building at the Senate uh, one afternoon, one lunchtime, and I was standing right outside the Supreme Court. And some man walked up to me and said, hi, Susan. Uh, I bet you know something about Lockerbie. I bet I have a story I could tell you. And he told me, and he said, I'm going to take you to lunch. He said, I'm going to take you to the Hunan. I said, oh, you want to go to that restaurant? He said, no. That's the 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 down the 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 downtrodden Hunan where you and I used to go. So I'm gonna take you uptown. I'm gonna take you to a more classy Hunan than that. And he took me to lunch and he told me the story of Lockerbie, and and he never introduced himself by name, uh, but he was obviously I was riveted. He told me exactly why they did it, and he gave me more information and put Richard Fuse's experience into a context. And what you see, it, what you find out is that a lot of these operations are 
are much more complicated and there's more depth and complexity. And there are reasons why things are being done the way they're being done. Like, for example, if I tell you that I, that, that I gave $2,000 to an Iraqi agent on my behalf, now it makes sense. Everything makes sense. You know, the, the shootout in Baghdad over Abu Nidal, why I was after Abu Nidal. Everything makes sense. But, and, and, but the, the, the story of Lockerbie, uh, I think, needs to be told. This was, it's, it's not as simple as you think. Um, it was during the 1980s and Lebanon's civil war. This is the real story of Lockerbie. Okay, forget what Chuck Schumer told you. Forget what all the propagandists told you. This is the real story of Lockerbie. Um, and it was explained to me over lunch one day by this man who just dropped in and he said, you know, you, you think we're such bad people. Because he said, I'm listening to your phone calls and I can tell you think that we're the bad guys. We're not the bad guys. We were dealing with a very complex world. And he said to me that, um, and, and uh, he uh, it was in a nutshell, in a nutshell, what <laughs> happened with Lockerbie? What happened with Pan Am 103? What, okay. What was the downing? What happened? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, during, during the Civil War, they had been taking United hostages from the West. The, the Lebanese, the, the Hamas uh, Lebanese jihad, Islamic Jihad. Okay. These were Islamic radicals who were using heroin to finance their Islamic Jihad. Mm -hmm. So they were taking these hostages. The CIA made a decision that they would, whether you like the decision or not, this is what happened. They made a decision that they would, inter, that they, in order to, to identify the location of the hostages, including Terry Anderson, Terry Waite, all those very famous people. Uh, uh, there's a list of them. There's a list of them. And you right. can go find it. CNN bureau chief, the CIA station chief mm -hmm. beat to death with bricks, hung from his from by his fingers, by his thumbs, from the ceiling and with a with a hook, you know, in his back. I mean, they beat oh my God, they beat the shit out of these people. And um so they want they made a deal with the devil. The CIA decided that they would that in order to in to investigate and identify the location of the hostages they would interact with the, the heroin the, on the heroin side of it. And they, were, they would provide some supply routes mm -hmm. from Lebanon through Germany and London into New York. And they would move the heroin throughout, through Pan Am, one of, through Pan Am, okay? Pan Am was the airlines for moving the heroin. And they said that they were doing it because they had to, they had to find some way to identify where these hostages were being held. Mm -hmm. And the defense intel, that was the CIA side. The defense intelligence agency, McKee, I think was his name, uh, didn't like th that what they were doing. He felt that they were, that every time they were getting close to the hostages, it's been a while since I thought about these people by their names. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, every time they started to get close to the hostages, the hostages would be moved again. Right. And that was because somebody was starting to enjoy the profits from the heroin mm -hmm. because the heroin is big business now. Sure. sure. And so you've got this double-edged sword. On one hand, you want to get the hostages. On the other hand, you want to keep your profits coming in because everybody's getting rich. Right. So the defense intelligence agent flew back to Washington and reported it and said, this has got to stop. We've gone too far. This is, you know, we just started off as a, as a deal with the devil that's gone out of control. So the, they, they sent agents back into Lebanon mm -hmm. to investigate, to find, to get the money and the heroin and get evidence that they could use to prosecute this and stop it. And when they were coming back, from Lebanon, heading to Virginia, they were all routed onto Pan Am 103. And everybody who, who was Eddie Dane, like they put out, the State Department actually put out a, a bulletin saying, 
if you're traveling on this flight, put it out to State Department employees and foreign diplomats saying, get off this flight. There is a danger. There is danger on this flight. If you've got a flight, get off it. And people were and some people like uh, there was a South Af couple of South African diplomats who tried to board the flight and they were told, nope, you're not going. They're like, why? Why can't I fly on this flight? Nope, nope, nope. You're not going. You're not going. Everybody was pushed off. That left room for uh, vacant seats at Christmas time for a group of kids of students from Syracuse University flying standby to get on the flight. Mm -hmm. They were innocent. They were young. They had their whole lives ahead of them, bright mm -hmm. futures. And because all the other people, the powerful, important people were told, get the hell off the, no, you're not getting on that flight. Right. No way. We're, you'll thank me later. But the, but the, but the two groups, but, but that opened the way for the students to get on. And what had happened was that the people um, who were carrying the heroin and the, 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 the law enforcement inspectors who were, and, and DIA and CIA people who needed to be removed. Mm -hmm. They wanted to kill off the evidence, destroy the evidence, shut it down, fail safe, extreme prejudice. Mm -hmm. This is how it ends. <laughs> so you're, this saying, how it ends. <laughs> you're, you're saying that uh, Ab Abdul uh, Nabal is the one who put the, the bomb on the plane? Yes. In the It was in his luggage? Uh, it was, it was, uh, he, he, he arranged the Lockerbie bombing. Yeah. But it was also, they knew because of the Stasi in East Germany, uh, uh, Abu Nidal Ahmed Jibril, uh, Ahmed Jibril was, was operating in, in East Germany and the Stasi had infiltrated that. So they, you know, all of this, this very convoluted scheming comes together. And they knocked out the, the team that was going to be exposing the heroin trafficking. They wanted to kill the story dead. So no one would ever know that they'd been doing it. And it would be, that's what they do in the spook world. And that's really what they did to me too. Uh, it doesn't mean that I was a bad person. It doesn't mean I broke the law. Right. I categorically deny breaking the law. I, you know, Kelly, you knew me for right. years. Right. I right. love the United States. Right. I'm passionate about trying to help our country and make our country strong. Mm -hmm. um, and I would not be, it, it, it just doesn't, it's not in my DNA to behave like that. I'm more of a Girl Scout, ironically. Sure. All yeah, right, so, so we're moving from, like, I'm going to keep you on track here because, you know, your story is so large. I actually could have done three shows with you, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, that's sort of where, you know, I came in on your behalf, which, again, we're not even through your story was because I read what you wrote about Lockerbie. And, and well, thought, you were there. You were there with Paul Hoban and I. You knew that we'd been working. You'd been there. You'd been in, you know. I what, never heard you and Paul talk about it. Paul told it me secret. about it. It was secret over between us. One night. And so when you were, when I was reading your, you know, write up on it, I, on, on Google, I, you know, I was like, it, it just hit me that, oh, my God, Paul told me the very same story. OK, yeah. so that's when I contacted you once you had been released from Carswell to go to the uh, hearing in New York. But anyway, so so now yeah. let's go back to you, but know, you had known Paul and I and you had seen us together. And it, and it is also true what, what you're saying, that our conversations about Libya and Iraq were always strictly confidential. And that became a, a sort of, that became a, a difficulty when I had my fight with the feds because everybody had seen Paul and I together mm -hmm. and everybody knew that Paul was intelligence, but nobody really knew, but our conversations were not open, indiscreet conversations. We, right. were, we were privately just having, private, you know, we whispering moments where we talk together and right. just everybody would be like, kind of like shut out of our conversation. And, um, but we were very, very close. Yeah. And I, I loved him. I, I, he, I, I absolutely loved him like a big brother. Yeah. We were incredibly close and we were doing real anti-terrorism work, not like this fake FBI, you know, recruits, like find some uh, dissatisfied Somalian yeah. Immigrant, 
is these were real people who really wanted to get you. Mm -hmm. And there were probably in the whole planet, there were probably 300 of them. 300. Yeah. Off uh, camera, off camera later, we'll, you and I'll talk, I'll tell you some things that Paul told me about you that weren't very big brotherish, okay? <laughs> I, I know, I know. And, and, and part of, part of what happens to me, which was so, um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to what they did to me afterwards, but in my business, it's like when they, it's like when they did Lockerbie, Lockerbie was, they killed those men to silence the operation. When they shut it down, they will kill you. Mm -hmm. And, and you know this, I mean, so I, I, you know, I have to, I have to, Paul always used to say to me, you know, you can't be this little female who comes back and cries and says, oh, you hurt my feelings. Oh, you, you know, you, I, you beat me up and now I'm bloody. <laughs> he said, this is a rugby match. And you, we are, we're dealing with Libya and Egypt and Iraq. And that means Britain because Brit Scotland is part of the Great Britain, the right. United Kingdom. Right. And Israel is involved, you know, it, everybody has an opinion and they are not generous about Gaddafi like I was. So let's them jump really in. Hated them. They hated Saddam, they hated Gaddafi. And I was the little female who was dealing with Iraq and Libya. So I'd get like kickback. I mean, they'd like boom, boom, boom. You know, they, they, they don't, they don't just, um, tap you on the shoulder and say, nice little girl, could you? No, they hit you and they pound you. They beat the living shit out of you to make sure you know what they want. And if they don't feel you're getting the message, they hit you again, harder. And I had come out against the war. So, you know, but my entire career from day one was the absolute under not deep intrinsic knowledge that it, it that that spooks when they when they need to shut something down, they go they go to extreme prejudice, okay. and that means they will kill you. So let's they talk will, about they really meetings. will kill you. Let's talk about your meetings. Uh, you know where you were working with the embassies, taking information to Andrew Card. Um, I had been, uh, so, so my operation started in Libya. It, it actually started with Iraq in 1996. Uh, let's see, I started with Libya in 95. I started with Iraq in 96. And so Andrew Card comes in, you know, 2001. And by that time, I'd been several years doing this operation work. And so I was, I was at the top of my game by that point. I was not uh, incompetent. I was not failing. I was not mediocrity. You, I had already given advance warning about the 93 World Trade Center attack, advance warning about the bombing of the USS Cole, and we were already looking for the attack on 9-11, okay? Yeah, and yeah. I had already run an operation to get the terrorists out of Libya in 90. Uh, 95, 96, 97. Uh, I'd already survived an attack on my life by Abu Nidal in 98, 98, summer of 98. Um, so six months before the handover of the two men, I negotiated the handover of the two men with Ambassador Dorda, who was the who was who was married? Dorda was married to Gaddafi's sister. So again, this is a very small circle of people in both countries that run everything. Mm -hmm. And the idea that I was able to get this very high-ranking Iraqi diplomat, who was the best, who was close friends of not best friends, but close social friends with Saddam's son, mm -hmm. was a very big deal. It was it was hugely significant. Um, and so you're telling the White House, basically, when you're communicating with Andrew Card, who, let's explain who he is. Uh, Andrew Card was the chief of staff to George Bush. That meant that every detail that I was giving to the White House was going straight to the president of the United States. With and what, no is Card, what is Andrew Card to you? Andrew Card was my second cousin. Uh, I, in college, I'd known Andrew Card for decades. Now that was a lie that they told. They also, they tried to say that we, he did, we didn't know each other. 
That was not true. I had been close friends with Andrew Card's younger brother, Brad, Mm -hmm. who used to visit me at college when he was at St. Anselm's and I was at Smith College. We were both freshmen at the same time. And so I was very close, very, very close with with, uh, Brad Card. So what, and, if, if, you know, if Andrew, Andrew and I knew Andrew Card and I knew each other as you know the the younger you know she the, like the you the younger cousin who right. hangs out with your brother so and I would visit we'd yeah. visit oh yeah we'd visit together at family but by that time Andrew Card was like ten years was you know ten or 15, ten years older than we were. So he was like much older. He was like an adult. And he's chief of <laughs> we staff. Were kids. We, were not, we were in college. Brad and I were in college. But but Andrew, well, we'd have family dinners and such. And when I'd go to the family dinners, I'd hang out with his, with his younger brother is what I would do. Okay. Sarah Card had graduated from Wheaton College, another woman's college. She had just started her first job. And so, you know, we were all like, you know. Okay, so so that's good. So I'm just, I'm just trying to... Family. Exactly. You were you were extended family. He knew who you were and he knew you were providing this information to him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He knew immediately what was going on. And um, I told him that I gave him debriefings that I had been working in anti and real anti-terrorism at that point for, you know, for 10 years. Uh, I think it's important for everybody to know that my very first case that brought me to the attention of Paul Hoven and Pat Waite who was the chief of staff to Helen Bentley of Baltimore, was that I gave advance warning about the 1993 World Trade Center attack. I Two days before the, uh, I happened to be very good at this. It's synchronicity. There's something weird about my life. It's just synchronicity is very big for me. And um, I, had dis- I had discovered the first attack on the World Trade Center and I had walked into, I did a walk into the uh, Tunisian embassy two days before the attack. And I, and I told them about the attack. And that got every, then, you know, when, when a stranger, a woman walks in and says, there's going to be a terrorist attack on the United States. Here's where it's going to be. And, you know, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to tell you about it. Have a nice day. Bye. And then two days later, the attack. They were like, you know, when I first went in, they were like, who is this little Chiquita? <laughs> who the heck is this little girl coming why in? Why did you choose us- that embassy? Uh, it was Yasser Arafat's embassy. And why did, what? Um- because I thought Yasser Arafat would know about terrorism. <laughs> I thought if anybody was going to know what to do about it, it would be him. So I, in good faith, I told the Tunisians. Um, and I had also... Uh, been a member of the National Press Club at that point. Mm-hmm. And I was a, a, a young up and coming journalist. This was very significant. I had gone to the Na- a National Press Club event where Hana Ashrawi was speaking and I was being a young up and coming journalist. I was seated at her table with her. She was actually on the podium, but there was like a, a, a primary table mm-hmm. and it was had been loaded with spooks and diplomats from Tunisia. And I had struck up a conversation with a Tunisian man who I thought was sympathetic with me. Mm. And I had told him that I knew a man in, uh, who had been in Israeli prison and his mother thought he was dead. And I said, I need to speak with you. I need to talk to you. Mm. And at that moment, a spooky person came down and I didn't know who they were. I, I, I was like, oh, I wonder if that's a spy. He was taking photographs of everybody at the table. And he came and he sat right next to me. Because I was I was like leaning over the table saying, I got to talk to you because I know this man. I got to tell you something about this man. He's a real terrorist. And his mother thinks he's dead. And he was in an Israeli prison. And at that moment, this guy who's been going around the room taking photographs comes and sits right next to me. And I was like, ah. And he and the guy thought that he that he was going to like jump in on the conversation and I shut up. I went quiet. And so but then afterwards, I contacted the embassy, look, the Tunisian embassy looking for that individual. I said, well, but I found I need to talk to him because I think he'll understand me. I have a message that I have to tell. No, it could only be him. They're like, well, j- just come in, just come in. and t- Tell us what is this? And, and, and they're like, it must have been part of Hana 
Ashrawi's entourage traveling with her from Tunisia. I said, well, I have to give him this message. It is critically important. So I went into the, and I said, okay, but you're going to deliver it. He said, you come in, you tell me the message, and I will make sure that they find it, that they receive it. I said, okay, there's going to be a terrorist attack on the United States. <laughs> but at that point, nobody believed me until two days later. And then it was exactly as I said, I said, here, 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 boom, 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 boom. And, and the guy was like, what, at the, like I said, at the meeting, he was like, oh, you, you, you have a great imagination. This is, you know, I know you love your country. You have a great imagination. Have a nice day. And then two days later, it happened. And they're like, and it had, there had not been, been an attack on the U U.S. soil. This was the 93 World Trade Center. That was 93. Precedes, precedes the Oklahoma City bombing by right. two years. So this is the first t real terrorist attack. And a lot of people say, well, the FBI organized it. I did not know that. OK, I admit that I did not know that maybe the FBI had already infiltrated it. I did not know anything like that. Mm -hmm. All I knew was that I had information. I turned out to be right. And they freaked. Mm -hmm. That was when I was put under a microscope. Mm -hmm. I would literally go to, to um, my job at at, uh, at that point. I was uh, had stopped being a journalist and I had. Uh, become it was just starting to be a congressional staffer mm -hmm. and I would go to work and I would and I would be like in tears I was so frightened of what was going on the, I was under such a microscope it was deeply pressurized and I have to tell you I'm so glad Paul, so, no, wait, wait, I'm gonna so, Paul Hogan, so then so Pat Waite so my father knew Pat Waite right. and Pat Waite said you know, they, they, the spooks wanted to make contact with me because they wanted to, first they vetted me and they found out that I, that I did not have anything to do with the attack. So that was the first thing they found out was that I was not connected to the attack at all. And I had tried to stop it. So then they wanted to make contact with me to find out who the heck I was speaking with in Washington, D.C. They would be telling me this stuff. And so that's when they sent Paul Hoven to meet me with Pat Waite. And I, Pat Wade insisted on me coming to have dinner with her in Alexandria. And I'll never forget it. She, she was like looking at the menu and I'm like, she's this, I thought she was an old lady. She was our age at that right. point. Right. You know, I thought I was like, oh, she's a really old lady. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was so young. I was so young. And, um, and then she, she looked up from the menu and she said, Paul, by the way, Paul Hoven's coming. He's with the Defense Intelligence Agency. And then she put her head down again in the menu. And I was like, oh, I don't think that's a very good idea. I should leave right now. And she said, no, you're going to stay. <laughs> so she, I met said, she said to me, you I, are going to stay. Yeah, but I met Paul three years before you did. Yeah, yeah, yes. You had known Paul 25 yeah. years. Yeah. Amazing. 25 I, years. Pat, where you, you and I have a special, special synchronicity, Kelly, a special, special this synchronicity. This is so bizarre because Pat Waite introduced me to Paul three years before you were introduced to Paul. But my introduction to Paul was because I was working on the death of a Marine in San Salvador. Oh, yes. In Congress. I was working for, you know, uh, Ray McGrath at the time, Congressman McGrath. And uh, there was a death of a Marine at... Uh, our embassy. So Pat decided, Pat, wait. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I met her at the press club. I met Pat wait at the press club. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden Paul Hoven is like, I went to dinner with Pat to meet Paul. Cause he might have some information for me. That's right. Wow. Interesting. Right. And I was like, I want it when she told me he's with the defense intelligence agency. Sure, head popped down under the menu again. And I said, I want to leave. I need to leave right now. And she said, and she looked up and she said, you are not going to leave, Susan. You are not going. She, she was not smiling. I'm smiling. But she was like, you are not leaving, Susan. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's fast forward. Let's fast no. forward to. Um, now You're getting... bringing back memories of, of things that. Um, yeah, it's it like Kelly. It's it's so good to see you. I'm I'm so glad that you to 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 catch up with you. I owe you so much. No, you don't owe me anything. 
So let me let me interrupt you because uh, I want to get these. I want to get this set up for our next show. So you're giving information to your second cousin, Andrew Card, chief of staff to Bush One. Yes. Right. B B uh, the, Bush, okay. No, Bush Two. Bush. It's Bush Two. HW. HW. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so so he's you know he's passing that information along. So oh, they, they, yeah, it's going straight to the top of the White House. OK. And this is where um, this is. I, I. It's so important to understand how the spooks react when they have to shut down an operation hard and fast. There's no middle ground. They cut they cut it out with a scythe and just and it goes to the roots and they rip it out. And that's what they did to me on my story. So, so how did that we have, do we have do we have uh, time now to talk about Iraq? Yeah, let's 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 give a little bit of time, five ten minutes, and then okay. uh, lead us okay. into the the rest, and well, then we're going to talk about everything that happened after your arrest next week. Okay. Well, well, here's here's the thing. Um, moving on to Iraq, I had been working in anti-terrorism, at covering the Iraqi embassy as well, and. Saddam Hussein was actually one of our best sources on anti-terrorism because Saddam was deeply afraid of the Islamic radicals taking advantage of sanctions and the deep poverty of the Iraqi people. And so he was very, he had his ear to the ground, uh, his ear to the wall, mm -hmm. listening devices everywhere, every conceivable place. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most paranoid leaders. Definitely true. Lindsey Graham is right about that. But what he was doing was uh, terrorists would try to come into Iraq, taking advantage of the sanctions. Saddam would kind of like Abu Nidal would sort of tolerate them until they would break some rules. And then Saddam would kill them or deport them. And if they were Saudi citizens, he could not kill them. So he would he would deport them. And that is how we come to the bombing of the USS Cole. And the USS Cole as a precursor is, is extremely important to what happens with 9-11. So I, I, wanna, I wanna say that um, uh, my, my, my dealings were, were always, every single thing that I did was reported to the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency immediately. Uh, through, and I, it was, I was, I was meeting and, with and, No, no, through, let's be specific, through Paul Hoven and Dr. Fuse. Yes, yes. Okay. And I was having uh, weekly meetings with each of those individuals separately. And what was happening is they were triangulating what I would tell the Defense Intelligence Agency with what I would tell the CIA, and they would make sure, and then they'd, they'd, they'd match it up to make sure that these things, that the stories were aligning, that I was not telling one agency one thing and one agency something else. They wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page. And that's one of the ways that they, they compartmentalize it so they can counter check it. Mm -hmm. And each agency counter checks what that information is. So it was, uh, I, I loved my life. It is not a life that is easy. It is a life you choose actively and every hour you have to choose it again. You don't, it does not, um, uh, it, it doesn't ever stop. It, it stays on. It's, it's like the, there's, a, there's a great song called Moby by um, Extreme Ways. And you should listen to that. That song is everything. It is, a it is an adrenaline rush. You're doing global politics at a most intimate, personal level. You are directly in, engaged in whatever, you know, the, the men, men in, in the Senate just give a speech. And they say, oh, we don't like terrorism. And you're out there in America and you say, oh, we don't like terrorism. I do anti-terrorism. Mm -hmm. I know the people who are going to give Abu Nidal sanctuary. And my job is to get him out of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. My job is to get Monster Al Qasar indicted and sent to jail, and no, I, am the one, I am the one who's going to do it. Okay, so hang on. So, 
when you're doing this or get them killed and that was more often what we did when you are doing this susan are you dealing with any other assets in these countries well i'm always dealing i was always dealing with um I was dealing with British intelligence. British intelligence used to call me Miss Bossy Boots. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bossy Boots. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you what to do and you better do exactly what I... And they're like, you know, we're, we're Cambridge, we're Oxbridge. Oxford, Cambridge, you know, MI6. That we're we're the most we're the best and the brightest the most elite intelligence anywhere and you're going to tell us what to do yes okay I, mean, I would have I would have experiences with these interactions with let me let me give you an example I would go to dinner with uh with the embass with the ambassador from Libya and let me tell you we went to dinners all the time okay that was normal behavior and all these dinners were being reported so it wasn't like I was just doing them and not telling anybody. Every single th interaction was sanctioned and reported in detail. Like I would spend an hour telling Paul Hoven that, you know, what did he order? What fork did he use? How many times did he drink water? How many times did he get up to the, every detail, every conceivable detail? Hmm. Uh, and British intelligence would come in and they would get a table right next to ours. This happened repeatedly. Uh, British intelligence would they they come in? We'd sit down. This is be New York City crowded restaurant, mm -hmm. and they would pass the, the the ambassador and I knew they were doing this. Right. And 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 the ambassador would say, "Are they doing this because of me or because of you?" <laughs> but they would pass. They'd slide like a hundred dollar bill, and they would ask. They'd move the tables. Mm -hmm. They would actually pay them to move the tables. Mm -hmm. So I'd be, you know, we'd be sitting like here. It's New York, so it's like everything's crowded to begin with. And they would, and they, and, and the maitre d' would come in, and there'd be somebody else at a table right next to us. And that the the British intelligence would want that spot, so they would literally move a table, move tables out of the way, so that British intelligence could be seated right next to us, mm -hmm. and then. They would sit there. They would not order any food. They, they, there would be no coffee. Mm -hmm. They would have like a, 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 a pitcher of water on the table. Mm -hmm. And they would, they would, and nobody would order any food. And this is British oh. intelligence? Well, that's sort of a giveaway. I mean, that sounds like really, you know, really. They, sort of they, bad they wanted, no, no, they knew. They knew, everybody knew. It's a, no, they, it was this, it was, it was, uh, uh, it, they, they were, they were listening to what we were doing. Yeah, but you and, know they're listening. So what would you I know, but, why, but would, they, why would they think that anybody would say anything knowing that you. That well, because they, we were talking about, we, oh, we were planning the Lockerbie trial. We were doing the negotiations for the Lockerbie trial over dinner. Yeah, but the British, but the, but it's the British trial. It's the Hague. Mm -hmm. The trial is at The Hague. Mm -hmm. The people who are impacted are Scotland as part of Britain. So you have this goofy little female who, who is this naughty, this naughty little CIA asset <laughs> who, who, is, who is very mischievous. I mean, that was my reputation, uh, was that I was fairly mischievous. Yeah, but Susan. And, yeah, they, they, they knew. We, we knew. Stupid. We knew. But, but no, no, we let knew. Me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. Okay? If this is British intelligence... If, if what you say is true, yeah, it is true. They weren't trying to hide it, and you they were not trying to hide. It. Excuse me, let me it finish. Not Susan, you're gonna have to let me finish. So mm -hmm. you knew that they were listening. What? Why? First of all, if you're working with British intelligence, why would they be so stupid to sit down next to you and you know they're British intelligence? Knowing full they were well, British intelligence. Let me finish. Knowing full well, you're not gonna say anything. Because you know, oh, no, 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 no. See that that's the point. We were negotiating. See, this is what's so hard for you to understand. At that point, we were negotiating the Lockerbie trial. So there were things that Britain was demanding that I was coming in and saying, you got to do this and this. 
And what we're gonna, how are we gonna handle the evidence? How are we gonna handle the release of evidence? We gotta get the men turned over and surrendered over for trial. How are we gonna do these logistics? How are we gonna make this happen? And they were right there at the next table. And he, and so in fact, it heightened the credibility of what I was doing because they were listening to every damn word and every single thing was being reported back to Downing Street. Yeah, but you're telling me that the Libyan knew. You're yes. Well, then why? Would yes. It because sense? this was negotiations for the trial, yeah. and they had to know what they they wanted to know. So British intelligence was listening to the responses coming in from the Libyans. So I would make. I would him make to dinner. If everybody knows, everybody's listening. Why didn't you just invite them to dinner and have a conversation? Well, we we sort of. They were sitting at the next table, so we sort of did. <laughs> You should understand what I'm saying. This, this is a real story, Kelly. This is what really Stupid happened. Intelligence. It's not very intelligent to me. I'm sorry. No, no. It's a, we were. This was. This was a, a negotiation process, and we had to make sure that it was done. It's like the weapons inspections. Um, they. Uh, we got a. We got a, a room in a hotel, and they, we're not hiding this stuff. This is, this is being done. See, this is not Susan Lindauer. This is really important. This is not Susan Lindauer's foreign policy. This is U.S. Britain foreign policy. And the British were adamant. They were really, they were worried because everyone, we, we, everybody knew that McGrahi and FEMA were pretty much innocent. We had a problem because the, the, with, in terms of Libya, and it, this happens a lot more than you realize. It was not the intelligence community that was messing this up. It was the families of Lockerbie who could not understand that McGrahi and FEMA were being were patsies, okay? And that there was bigger issues. The hero, what are we, you know, the heroin trafficking, the, the hostage crisis. Lebanon is in a civil war situation where 20, Two factions are fighting it out of different religious ethnicities, are and the Palestinians and Israel's involved, and all these. You know, this is a war zone. This is a, a violent war zone where different suicide bombers from different groups who are, are living, who are in the live in the same neighborhood, are all attacking each other g -g 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 -g, constantly, okay. and and so you have you know British intelligence who's got a problem. It was one thing to say we want a trial because the families of Pan Am 103, the, the 24 kids from Syracuse universities, their parents wanted justice for them. Mm -hmm. And Chuck Schumer is out there telling him it's FEMA and McGrahi, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And we all know this, okay, but they so don't, but they don't. So what are we going to do with the fact with, how are we going to deal with the evidence? How are we, how, this was a big deal. How are we going to deal with witness testimony? How are we going to deal with evidence that does not, not only does it not confirm the lie, but it shatters the lie. Mm -hmm. It shatters the, 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 the mythology that the families have been clinging to. This was the hardest part. And it's like, it's like the, the weapons inspections. This is why I'm talking about this so much. The weapons inspections, it wasn't just that the CIA was wrong. It was that the people, the media, the publicity had programmed all of the American people to believe deeply. Saddam must have those weapons. Where are those weapons? Saddam must have them. Well, what if he doesn't have any? What if they really did get rid of them? Now, how are you going to justify? What are we going to do when, and this is where I come in. What are we going to do? How are we going to handle? So in case of Lockerbie, how are we going to handle the evidence? The British intelligence needed to hear that. How are we going to handle the witnesses who are going to say that, you know, how many, how are we, how are the Libyans going to deal with this? How do we get the families to hear the truth and then move past mm -hmm. the lie to go after the real people who really did it? Mm -hmm. That would be Abu Nidal. And so Abu Nidal, now here's the thing, Abu Nidal was, was in Libya during, for like 10 years. So it, Libya was giving sanctuary 
to now this was a big point for the British. Yeah, yeah we've already covered this. Okay, we've okay. But, but you're wondering why they were doing this. You know, they were they, you know, how do you justify the sanctions after you've done this? And they're hard to justify. But because they were the the, the, the real here. Okay. We're gonna we're we're getting off off the okay. Okay. I'm more interested in what happened to you. Okay. 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 I, I understand okay. That, okay. you know we Look, Susan, you know as well as I do, you could go on with this every day for 10 hours because it's just extremely interesting. But we have to have that kind of time. Okay. So here's what we're going to do we're going to wrap up this end of it. (laughs) I will see you again next week. Okay. We're going to talk about what happened to you. Okay. Um, uh, And Iraq uh, after you got arrested for all of your uh, contributions to the anti-terrorism in the United States. <laughs> and, and Kelly, it is a joy to see you again. It, <laughs> it really it, is. It's a pleasure for me too. We, really. have, we, have, we had so much, I mean, I have to tell you, our, our, our time in Washington was, I, I had a good, I mean, I was happy in my life. I made choice, I want every, because people are like, what they did to you is terrible. And it was, it was absolutely frightening. It was terrifying. To be subjected to extreme prejudice is a frightening thing. But during the period of time that we're talking about, I loved my life. I had the best life uh, that I chose. And I take responsibility for my choices. Nobody manipulated me. And people try to say, oh, you're this little female. Yeah, bullshit. Okay. We had, right. we had a good time. We had a good run. Susan, um, I'm going to have to end this portion. So I'll tell you what, um, uh, for my viewers, uh, please go out and uh, get a copy. of My uh, book is Extreme book. Prejudice. Extreme Prejudice on Amazon. And um, read it before the next show so you, <laughs> you can stay up to speed with Susan on this because it's going to go places, okay? This is all I can say. Anyway, Susan, it's been a pleasure. I will see you next week, and we will continue uh, with the show. Yes. Take care of yourself between now and then. <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, always, always a pleasure to see you, Kelly. I will yeah. I will chat with you, you again. This, this lady here saved my life. That's, That's absolutely it. true. That's very okay. kind. Take, Take care. care. Okay.